Yeah. I'm gonna do this in English for one reason. After two Spritzwein yesterday, I promised two Hungarian guys back there that I'm gonna do this, do this in English because they have some difficulties with German. Um, yeah, so that's why. Protect your user accounts like it's 2019. Um, you know me by now, I'm Thomas Konrad. I'm penetration tester, software security guy at SVA Research. I do some training, software development myself, so I'm a little bit of a developer as well. And um, yeah, you know that by now, you, you, uh, EB has presented me already. Uh, why are we here? Why are we talking about this topic? Uh, I will make some assumptions, okay? The, assumption I'm, uh, the assumptions I'm making is uh, we are developing an application, say a smartphone application or a web application, and that application has user accounts. So it has accounts, you can log into the application, right? Um, we're also assuming for our threat model that the data that we're processing in that application is at least somewhat sensitive. It carries personally identifiable information or something like that. It's some, at least somewhat sensitive. Um, and I also suppose that many people have a hard time coming up with proper solutions when it comes to user account security because it's, it's a hard thing to do right. I've been penetration testing for over nine years now and I haven't seen a single application where it is done really, really well. I didn't test like Google or Dropbox or Twitter. They have whole teams of people doing just that. Um, but uh, you know, the smaller applications, very few of them do this very, very, very good. But the first question we, w we have to ask ourselves, what do we protect ourselves against? So some motivations for these measures that, um, that we're doing here. You know the CIA triad by now, you've heard this several times. I repeat this for a specific reason, because for the threat model we are looking at here, um, we are putting two things into one. Why? Because when it comes to user account security and someone manages to log into your account, then it is uh, both the confidentiality and the integrity of the data is, um, um, is at stake. So if when somebody logs in, they can both read your confidential data and, data and they can manipulate the data, right? So this is the starting point. The C and the I are in one pot. That's just a special thing about this specific and limited threat model of our applications. And availability is a separate one. So the basic threat model I'm drawing here, this is, might not be exactly the threat model that you have for your applications, but this is you know, um, one that I came up with. We have the threat of password guessing. So somebody can just go ahead and try different combinations of usernames and common passwords and log into accounts. This happens if you don't do anything about it. If you have a big user base, it's gonna happen. So we have to do something about that. And as I said, the confidentiality and the integrity are both at stake at this specific threat. Then we have kind of the opposite thing. If somebody manages, if you have, let's say, a user lockout, you lock your users after five or 10 uh, failed login attempts, then somebody can go ahead and systematically log your users out. So we have an availability problem kind of at the same time. This is, by the way, the hard part about all this, right? You do one thing and you have the other vulnerability at the same time. Um, then somebody could go ahead and uh, take a list of well-known passwords on the internet and try those, right? Um, somebody could dump the whole database on the internet because you have, uh, um, I don't know, remote code execution, uh, vulnerability, what we just saw, or SQL injection, something like that. The data is somewhere on the internet. Your database is there. What can we do to prevent at least, we cannot prevent this maybe directly, but uh, what happens after it, right? And also another threat, enumerating valid usernames, also known as user enumeration. Um, and I have a very, very, very rough severity of those threats. Don't take this as granted yet, right? So this is totally up to your application and the data it carries and what, how sensitive it is. It's just a very rough approximation to that. That's, you know, it, it says that here. So this is just a word of warning. Now, the game is on. We're playing Hammerhead with user account security. Who knows the game Hammerhead? Right, you, you have a hammer in your hand and there are, in this case, it's shark heads that are popping out. And when you, when you put one of those heads inside with your hammer, another one pops out, right? And it goes on like this forever. And this is kind of the thing with user account security because if you solve one problem, the other one pops out. If you solve the confidentiality integrity stuff, you have, uh, you have availability problems, right? So it also goes up and down, always goes up and down. And this is uh, something where we need to find the balance. We want all those heads half inside. That's kind of what we want to achieve here. 
So the C, I, and the A are many times contradictory. Um, we have to find a balance between those th things. So the, the, the all-time classic of user account security is the password guessing and the account lockout. If I solve one, the other problem pops up. You know, hammerhead with account security. So let's have a look at the though shall not pass, so the C and the I first. What can we do about the problem of somebody logging into your account with, you know, guessing passwords? Just some ideas. Throttling. Sorry? Throttling. Throttling? Yeah, we can throttle requests. If somebody sends us a million requests in one hour, we can say, this looks fishy, we block that IP address, yeah. Yeah, but I just said, uh, you can lock the account, you can uh, fully lock it or you can temporarily lock it. You should have both in place, by the way. Um, policy. Password policy, absolutely, can help because it uh, should lead to se more secure passwords. It's a different hammerhead game because it's a usability thing as well. If you look at bigger websites, many times they don't have either no password policy at all or they have just a minimum number of, you know, you need to have six, six characters at least or something like that. Um, yeah, it could be, you know, uh, the client needs to compute something before he can log in so that uh, you cannot do this in a big uh, million requests in 10 minutes. Captures, Captures can be uh, one thing that can help against automation. All good ideas. Awesome. Um, let's have a look at, at a couple of those measures. What does a modern password policy look like? What I hear sometimes or hear very often is that we need a minimum length and we need uppercase and we not need lowercase and we need uh, special characters and stuff like that. Nobody likes this, okay? We all know that nobody likes this. Even think of, for example, who uses a password manager in here? Almost everybody. That's amazing. If you generate a password with a password manager, it contains usually characters and numbers. And it, if it's a 32 character long password, it doesn't need special characters. It's, it has enough entropy to be a good password, right? So we don't like these special characters and stuff like this. Um, there is um, a NIST special publication, 800-63-3, uh, the Digital Identity Guidelines, and they had a major overhaul in June 2017. So the new recommendations, in a nutshell, they are not 100% accurate, but it's what it boils down to. We want to nuke periodic changes. We don't need periodic changes. We want one secure and good password, and that's it. Uh, so that's cool, right? We don't want to change our passwords. All I do is I change the last letter all the time, right? It's just stupid. I can't come up with a good password all the time. So complexity rules, we don't want them because if a password manager generates a long password, it's not complex, it's just long, but that's good as well. So yeah, we don't want those anymore only require a minimum length, something like 8 or 10 or 12. Depends on your sensitivity level. And one thing that was added to this list is you, we should screen our passwords against a list of compromised passwords. That's the harder part, part to do. Some of you uh, might know an API that's out there in the internet where you can check your passwords. We're going to talk about that very soon. Uh, and the maximum length must at least be 64 characters. This might so sound a little bit confusing, but it, it, uh, says just, it just says that the application must not limit the, the password length to, say, 16 characters. Because this is what all your password manager users here annoys you, right? If you have a 32-character super cool random password and it's not accepted by that fucking application, right? That's Cool as well for you guys, right? 90% here are using Password Manager. I'm very delighted about this fact. Um, and what it also says is that we require multi-factor authentication for at least high privilege accounts. And they should offer it for all accounts for people who want to use uh, multi-factor authentication. So this is um, um, a um, um, an illustration used by NIST for you know, some of those things on another slide. Um, who knows Troy Hunt's Pawn Passwords API? Wow, I'm impressed. Um, so that's an API, API where you can send the first five ASCII hex characters of a SHA-1 hash of the password, which means I take the password, I hash it, I get this long hash, Matthias explained how they look like, and then just cut off the first five bytes, which is 20 bits if you take it like this, and back you get a list of password hashes and uh, that are exposed somewhere in a data breach and with a count associated to it, so how often it was breached. 
Now the good thing about this is you don't expose your password di directly with it because with those five characters of the hash you cannot compute um, one unique password. It's just one of those, in, on average it returns 490 or something passwords. So we have a K anonymity value of 490. This service cannot tell which one of those passwords it was. It would have to go and guess. Um, so it's okay to use this public API. It's better than it sounds at first sight. Somebody would say, you send your password over there. Yeah, you don't really send your password. You send a part of the hash. You can discuss about this thing. The, the thing is you can also do this offline in your own company if you want because the database is downloadable. Just a huge text file with all these SHA-1 hashes with account associated to it. So this is what it could look like um, if somebody changes their password and enters a new password. It says, this password is part of a public data breach. Please use a different password. You might have seen this uh, in application sometime. This is what we should do nowadays. This is what the recommendation of NIST says. Um, and, and we can discuss these things, right? None of these things is perfect, but uh, we can dis discuss them afterwards. Use proper hashes. And uh, this is something we uh, talked about already. And that's basically what you said. If you have the choice, use Argon2, because Argon2 is not only one of those hash algorithms that takes long to compute, and taking long to compute is something that we want. If the, password, the, the database with the password hashes is breached somewhere on the internet, I don't want the attacker to be efficient in brute forcing my passwords. Argon2 does a good job in three different uh, perspectives. It's slow, it uses a lot of memory, and it uh, limits parallelization, is that correct? I think so, yeah. So it's three aspects that it does. It's not just slow, it does three different things. Uh, Bcrypt is okay, has some pitfalls. Uh, for example, if you have a password with a null character in it, it cuts the password right there because, you know, in C, uh, strings are null terminated. It's something to watch out for. Um, Password-based key derivation function version two, depending on the number of iterations, is also okay to use. This is what most of the password managers use, by the way. Um, I don't know, I think that the default for key pass and one password are pbkdf2. What we should do as well is lock users after too many failed attempts. I will get back to this later. Uh, what we should have in place is a soft lock and a hard lock. Hard lock means users locked out and somebody from support has to unlock that user. Soft lock means I'm locked out for say one minute or 10 seconds or 10 minutes, just a limited time. It lowers support calls. That's why people do it, right? It's, uh, yeah, people can unlock themselves by just waiting 10 minutes. Um, I would generally, and again, don't take this for granted, but I would generally recommend a soft lock, for example, five minutes after five failed attempts, but it really comes down to thinking about what your confidentiality integrity requirements are. I can't build it, you know, people keep asking me, what should I do? What I say is, it depends, but most of the time this is suitable, right? Multi-factor authentication is something that we should at least optionally offer if you want to be serious about security, right? If we develop an application, we should take this into account in our requirements analysis, in our design phase, in the implementation phase. Um, this is what a token-based one-time pad could look like. We have, you know, when you set it up, you have to scan it once, you have to enter the token already in the setup dialog to make sure people actually scan that code and have it in their, in their Google Authenticator or whatever app. Uh, and then when this is the code that is generated and when you log in, you put this token here. It's also, um, this is an actual application I'm showing you here that I'm developing with my colleague Michael over, Michael over here. Michael, Michael, whatever. Um, and what we implemented here is that we show the user uh, where to find that information. For example, if you have multi-factor authentication with, um, uh, with text message to, your, to, the smart, to the phone, uh, you should tell the user, I've sent a token to this phone number. You know, people get confused about this, we noticed. Um, right, so I think these things are pretty clear, right? Password policy, multi-factor authentication, proper password hashes. Now, one thing that is, tends to be less clear in, in, from my point of view is that we need transparency about what happens with the user account. And uh, transparency can mean something like, for example, if there is a login from a new device, I want to send out a notification to the user and tell them that there's something fishy going on, right? You see this with bigger uh, web applications out there, Google and Apple and Dropbox and, and Facebook and whoever, they all send notifications when there's a new device, right? You log in with a new device and there's the geo IP information, you logged in from Vienna or you logged in from somewhere else. 
so that you can e at least know when something, something fishy is going on. Right? If this all happens inside a black box, it's hard for you to detect. Stuff happens, attackers are there, they're going to try stuff, they're going to succeed sometimes, they're going to log in with other people's user accounts. But if that happens, we want at least to be able to react upon it. Right? So that's the thing. There's one thing, how to implement that, I'll, I'll give you some, uh, some let, let me name it, uh, application security design patterns that can lead to this where it, it can get easy for you to implement it. This is what the email looks like in the application both, we both are doing. So log in from a new device. Um, this looks a little bit weird, but it was my dev machines, I'm sorry, uh, not a real email, um, IP address. And it says here which device type it was. So we have a user agent string parser in there that just parses out which browser, which version on which platform and tells the user so they can know immediately what's going on. And inside our application, we have this list of devices. So um, these are the devices that ha the, the ha login happened sometime. And when there's a green dot, it means there's still an active session, right? The session is still valid. Um, Right, and this is the current device. We are logged on on Chrome, on Linux, uh, but I also used Firefox, and I used the Postman just to test the REST API. Right. This is very important, and every serious web application out there that cares about the sensitivity of its own data that it processes has something like this. Right? You can find it on GitHub. For example, in your settings, you have a list of devices. I stole the design, actually. Can I say this on video? Oh, I, I'm going to cut that out. So how can we do direct... Uh, devices. It's about devices, right? Not only users and sessions, but devices. So I need to recognize when a device comes back. And this is not about uh, uh, advertising or anything like that. It is not about tracking users. It's not at all. It's a security measure, right? So if somebody hears device cookies or device tokens, uh, people go crazy, but it's, it's a good thing if you do it just for, for this reason. So when we open up a session, we have actually two cookies. You can make, you know, I, I will say cookies, but you can do whatever you want. You can put them into local storage uh, and just any token anywhere in the browser where you can send it with the next request, right? So don't pick on me because I say, because I say cookie, because they're uncool. We use cookies. Um, and we have two cookies. We have the My App. Uh, this is not the actual name, but it's like that. A device, and it's a random token, just like the session token. And we have the My App Session, which is another one. So every time a user logs in successfully, we issue them a device token, so the next time they come back, we can say, okay, I've seen this device, and I put a higher level of trust into this device than if it doesn't have any. So device tokens in a nutshell. Device tokens are an important application security design pattern, I, I like to call it, because uh, it's a base line, um, a base implementation, a base feature for, m for many things that we need to do afterwards in order to achieve good account security. So in a nutshell, how do they work? So I catch successful login events. Every program language framework out there has a mechanism to catch successful login events. And if it is a new device, I issue a new device token. Um, and if that happens, so issuing a new device token means a successful login happened on a new device. So I have to send out that notification that we just saw, you know, new login from Google, Chrome on Linux, that IP address. Um, the token must be long running because I want to recognize the devices over a long period of time. It doesn't have anything to do with the session directly uh, and nobody can log in with it, right? If the session is dead, uh, that has belonged to, the se to that uh, device token, you cannot log in with it. Then you, but you have to connect the session to it. So if you have two entities in your, or two tables in your database, uh, in the session um, table, there needs to be a foreign key to the device table, right? So that you can say green dot or not green dot in terms of user has an active session or does not have an active session. By the way, what do you think, um, if you connect this to the user table, what type of relation does this need to be? A device belongs to a user, right? Can it belong to various users? It can, because if I log out and another user logs in with the same browser instance, it's one device but two different users. So take into account that the device to user is a one to n relationship. I have to change this in our application still. Still, that's, a, that's an open issue. Why not many to many? I'm sorry, it's many to many, of course. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I have to cut out many things here. Um, 
It's a man-to-man -man relationship because one user can have several devices, of course. It's a man -to -man, end to end relationship. So uh, imagine the following thing. We have um, this device here. It's a smartphone. We have this computer and we have a tablet. And all of those three have been here before. So they were issued a device token. And this one has also connected an active session. So it's the one that shows green, a green dot in my device list. Um, so device tokens do not just enable us to do notifications upon a new login on a new device, but they enable us to do a lot of other good things in terms of account security. I can list devices, we've seen that. Um, I can send notifications upon a new login, we've seen that as well. I can, for example, remember multi-factor authentication for devices where I want to remember them. Everybody who has a Google account has probably seen this, hopefully seen this dialogue, where it says, don't ask again on this computer or device. Guess how they do it? With device tokens. So they remember the MFA for a specific user on a specific device and say, OK, next time I don't ask for multi-factor authentication. Good for usability and only a very small downgrade of security at the same time. Um, we can uh, remember previous logged in users. We can slow down password guessing attacks. And that's what we want to have a closer look to because this is what we're interested in, right? We said C, I, and A, and Hammerhead. Uh, we are pushing down the C and I. The A pops up. But uh, with device tokens, we have a mechanism to kind of get a little bit uh, more of a balance between those two things. So they are, in general, very helpful for account security. It's not about tracking users or advertisement or anything like that. It's just about account security here. Um, just for the record, this is a diagram I draw for, for another training. I'm, yeah. I'm not going to go into detail. It's basically what I, sh what I told you before. Before we go into that, how can I slow down password guessing attacks, um, I want to finish the C and I part. We are still talking about C and I here, right? Um, user enumeration. User enumeration means I can enter an email address, and the web application tells me whether or not that email address exists on the system, right? Or whether or not that user is registered in my application. Is that a problem? In your bug bounty program, did, did this count as a vulnerability? It would have. It have. What I want to say here is um, it is a risk that can be accepted. It is sometimes OK to accept that risk. Look at Google, for example. They have user enumeration. And it's one of the biggest you know, web service providers in the world. So, I guess it's what, it was a deliberate decision to accept user enumeration. And they just, I don't think they just did it because somebody didn't know it better. They have a whole army of user account security guys and, and girls. So um, yeah, they did a deliberate decision on this. Think about it. If you want to really avoid user enumeration, you have to do a lot of things. This is really, 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 really hard for a comparably small problem. Because if you register a new user in the application, you have an open registration in this example. How can I avoid user enumeration here in the registration form? I have to tell the user that this email address, unfortunately, it's actually taken. I would want to have a Gmail account, but I couldn't. Um, it has to tell me that this, you, this email address, thomas.conrad at gmail.com, is taken. It has to tell me somehow. Yeah, I can go ahead and send them an email if it does, you know, but no. It's just, it, it would blow up the design of this form very, very, it would make it very big and complicated. Um, so when you have a registration, Tell me how you avoid user enumeration. It's very hard. So in a login form, it's pretty obvious. If you tell somebody that user does not exist on the system, pretty clear. That's user enumeration. But think about all the other things. Um, after user lockout, if you have a user lockout and you take one specific username, email address, and you enter 10 wrong passwords, what are you going to tell the user? Still invalid credentials? Or are you going to tell them invalid credentials and you've been locked out? If you tell them that they have been locked out, we have, again, user enumeration. It's all about error messages with very bad usability. This is what it boils down to, right? Uh, what about the password reset? Well, what people do there usually, usually is um, they say, um, yeah, we have received your request. And if that account actually exists, we're going to send you an email. Yeah. I mean, yeah. OK, you can avoid it there. Um, timing differences. Let me tell you something. If you send. An, um, a, an email address with a wrong email address with a wrong password to the web server, what's going to happen? It's going to check whether that email address exists and it's going to return immediately. 
Now, if you take argon2, for example, and it takes 200 milliseconds to compute, it will only compute the hash if the user actually exists. So the average response time for a valid user is going to be higher than if the user does not exist. Tell me how you fix that. We thought about this a whole week, and we didn't come up with a good solution yet. So if you have a solution, just tell me. Uh, what, is, what about other services that use the same uh, user database? Think about uh, some, some uh, service like AWS or Google or something like that. They have tons of services where you can log in and register maybe and use your username, and something sometime gives you a different response time. It's just so hard to avoid that I think, I don't know, I would want to ask one of the Google guys, I think they just accept it because it would be way, way, way too hard to avoid it first, and second, almost everybody is registered with Google anyway, so who cares? The bare information that somebody is registered with Google doesn't really tell you so much of that person. Um, so it, it boils down to error messages with really bad usability, username and or password wrong or uh, invalid credentials. Note that you might, got, uh, you might get locked out after too many failed login attempts. That's, based, that's actually our error message right now. I'm not happy with it. Um, or password reset received if that account exists and so on and so forth. So you see the user error messages that you give them are just not so usable. So if the pure fact that somebody is registered with you has, carries in itself sensitive information, this is, I think, Ashley Madison. They don't have user enumeration in the login form, by the way. I tried it recently. Um, then it might be OK to accept the, the, the risk of user enumeration. Because you might have different problems where you should put your resources into. That's all I want to say. I don't, I'm not saying user enumeration is, is cool and, and uh, you should accept it. I say uh, it can be OK, depending on the situation. And there are situations where it is OK. So what can we do for the C and the I, so the confidentiality integrity of our user accounts? We can use a good password policy. We can use proper hashes, such as argon2, if you have the choice. If you don't have the choice, or you have to use older algorithms, use bcrypt or password-based key derivation function. We can lock out users. We should have in place in our implementation hard lock and soft lock. Uh, we should offer multi-factor authentication and enforce it for high, um, highly privileged accounts. And we want transparency. So we want device lists and notifications if something happens in your account. Such as, for example, if somebody changes the password or enables or disables multi-factor authentication, you can use the same mechanism to send them a notification. Somebody dis disabled your MFA. That would be a valid information to know if, if that happened without my consent. Um, and we might want to protect against user enumeration, but think of the fact that this is really, really hard if you want to do it right. Think about all those edge cases that we just discussed. All right. Now, those should not lock, so we want to have a look at the A as well. So we want to keep the attackers from systematically locking out our users, and this is a pure contradiction to the C and I. So the hammerhead game is on again, and this is actually the very much harder part here. This cat over here is going to escape now. Yeah, this is what happens with the availability, unfortunately, if you do, don't do anything about it. Um, so let me give you um, a real-world example of what we are trying to do here. Um, we are getting a request in our web application that somebody wants to log in. And um, we want to, to decide whether or not we should lock this IP address or use or something like that. Now, in the real world, if you were the owner of that bakery here, um, and somebody came in and, and would say, OK, I want to buy this bread, but I'm sorry, I don't have any money with me. Uh, I have to go back home. Can I pay this tomorrow? Now, if the person on the other side um, has been here the last 30 years every day and bought bread, you would say, OK, I trust you. I've been here before. Um, let's do that. Just pay tomorrow, no problem. If you see that person for the first time, you would definitely put a different level of trust into that person, right? I would do at least. I don't know how about, uh, about you. Now, if we have, we suppose that we have device cookies already, right? We have those implemented because we need them for notifications that somebody has logged in with a new device. Now, if a, a login attempt comes for usedexample.org with no device cookie, so an arbitrary attacker from the internet that has never been here before and does not have a valid device, he, uh, they tried uh, three times, for example. Let's say we have a three lockout. And then um, now the user after three failed login attempts is locked out for devices without cookie. And that's the tipping point. If then after 
three hours, the, the actual user comes by and has been logged in before that, so has a valid device cookie, we can say, the user is locked, but not for you because you are presenting me a valid device cookie. You have been here before. You're that woman in a bakery that has been buying bread the last 30 years, so I have a higher level of tr trust in this device because I know it. Right? So with this, we can at least uh, get a little bit more of a balance between those two things because now only those people can be locked out who have never been here before. And that's better than nothing, right? It might be 60% of users cannot be locked out. That's a win. That's an improvement. Right? So, um, but an attacker could also get a device cookie, right? They can just register and get themselves a device cookie. So, um, if they try it with a device cookie, I also lock the user after three invalid attempts, but only for the device cookie that they had. Not for everybody. Again, if the user comes by with his valid device cookie, they can still log in. So uh, the point in this is, if the user has been here before, they, I just push them through the fast lane they can, in because, uh, they can go in because I trust them. Right? There, in the details, there are a couple of pitfalls, but in the end, it's not too complicated to implement this. Um, uh, you can save most users from, from this lockout. Um, now, for apps with public registration forms, what an attacker could do, they could just log in, get a device cookie, and log in again, they get another device cookie. They could get hundreds of device cookies and then uh, tr still try passwords for different users, right? So if one specific user tries login, you should also count login attempts for the users itself in case somebody's actually trying to attack. And if you, you register that somebody is trying to attack, you should just hard lock that specific user. That's an implementation detail that you should think of if you have public registration forms, right? That's why I said before, we should have both soft and hard lock. In this case, you would need a hard lock and they need to call support and, and justify their 100,000 login attempts, right? Which will be hard, probably. Great, so let's update the threat model because we had a threat model at the very beginning and we have uh, spoken about a couple of countermeasures. Let's see how our threat model looks right now. So we've just basically filled in the right column here and have a couple of countermeasures. Now for against password guessing attacks, what we can do is, for example, a temporary user lockout. This prevents an attacker from efficiently guessing tons of passwords. We can have a good password policy, which is, makes it less likely that somebody guesses an actual password. We can have at least optional multi-factor authentication so that people who care about security, and that's maybe, let's say, 20% of our users are really keen on uh, multi-factor authentication, they enable it, so at least 20% are protected against this. It's a good number. It's an improvement as well. Um, we want transparency because if something fishy happens, and it can happen and it will happen, that at least we know it and we can re react upon it. That's the only thing that this is uh, trying to achieve. Device lists and notifications with device tokens would be cool, and the ability to, for somebody to delete a device that they don't know. Like you guys can do on GitHub, you can also you can always go into settings and security and there's a device list and you can delete the device if somebody has logged in. And it's not you because it's not the browser that you're using. The attacker from the outside can not really know what browser you're using most of the time. Now, this is the C and the I, and this, you can see it's a couple of countermeasures that we need to do in order to have a good level of security. Uh, the account lockout is kind of contradictory, but we can achieve a balance between those two with selective lock lockout with device tokens. This can really help us out. Um, the misuse of known passwords, so if, uh, I don't know, a, a data breach happens and the actual pass password of a person is in there, um, it's kind of hard to protect against this, to be very honest, but multi-factor authentication can, you know, can help in this case, at least those people who have it uh, activated. Um, then it could happen that someone dumps the da database on the internet. What can, you can do about this is um, you can use proper hashes. It makes it less likely that somebody actually brute forces uh, those passwords. And against user enumeration, um, I put this into parentheses because in the average application it can be okay. It can be okay. But what you would need to do is uh, we need generic error messages that don't say whether or not a user exists, but just say something like, if that user exists, then that, right? Um, and also important, we need constant timing in everything. And Matthias, you're in cryptography, um, you know the constant timing is something that's very hard to achieve, also for cryptographic algorithms that need this, um, this property as well. 
And in web applications for such an application point of view, it's also hard to achieve. We know what we're talking about because we tried to come up with a solution for this, but we didn't really succeed in that. Um, so on all requests that contain the username, we need constant timing. And this is hard to achieve. Constant average timing, that means. Um, of course, these are not the things that you know, advanced companies with huge user bases do. There is more to that that you can do. But this can be a very good starting point for you to get a better account security. There's a question. Yeah, true. That's actually missing in account measures. Absolutely true. Yeah. So the pound pesos API, either locally or you take the public API, can help against this as well. About the timing differences, why not just wait a certain amount of time or do a hash on anything? Uh, you have to know in the code whether or not you have done a hash already. I don't think I don't say it's impossible. It's it's just uh, it adds a adds a bunch of code that if you stare at it the first time, you don't really know what's going on and it's hard to test. Um, but it's possible to do. Did we? Yeah. He fixed it. <laughs> Ask him. <laughs> All right. Uh, but true, yeah, that's missing a missing countermeasure here, uh, the pawn passes API. True that. So advanced countermeasures, um, because this is not all you can do. You can do many more things. And I've discussed with people in here in this room that do advanced stuff. But this is a good starting point for a new and basic application. Just make sure to take these things into your threat model and requirements analysis, because these are things that you need to implement. A device token is, you need to put work into this, right? And if it's there in the requirements analysis that we need device tokens in order to do other things, you know, it's more likely that it gets actually done. It's more likely that you know, it's taken into account later on. Advanced countermeasures could be something like, for example, geo IP blocking. Um, if somebody logs in from Vienna and then two minutes later in Tokyo, then something might be wrong. They might be using a VPN, but it's more likely that it's just an attack, right? Um, you know, Google does something like that. I once had a talk in, in Linz, and I, I tried the demo here. I logged into my Gmail account, or a fake Gmail account. Um, and then I traveled to Linz, and then I logged in there, and Google told me, no, you're not allowed to go in here, because two hours before you were in Vienna, and it's unlikely that you traveled that fast. You know, rail chat is really fast. Um, yeah. All, all sorts of heuristics. So everything that um, you know detects anomalies. Christian of Bitpanda told us he's gone already. Unfortunately, told us they have heuristics that it's if it's the same browser with the same fingerprint, it's more likely it's the same person. Stuff like this. But this is hard to do and and very and, and advanced countermeasures. Um, so a lot more can be done. But think about these things that we told now as a starting point for end users. You guys know it. I don't have to tell you. Use a password manager. Don't really use passwords. Turn on MFA wherever you can. And register on haveabinpawn.com because if a data breach happens where your email address is inside, you get a notification, which is pretty cool. So let's sum this up. Um, first, what should, you, what should you do? Define the confidentiality, integrity, availability requirements for the data that you're processing. This is a very important starting point because without that, you cannot make an educated decision about what you need to do and what not. Right? The threat model looks different. Um, do your threat model, maybe on base of that one, maybe just coming up with your own ideas. Uh, implement device tokens because they are a, base, a, a baseline for many things, for many measures that we can do for good account security. Protect the C and I with password policy, proper hashes, using the pan pawn passwords API and stuff like that. And protect availability with selective lockout and don't do it just globally because then you have, then so come, somebody could just go ahead and systematically lock out all of your users. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we already had some questions, so two or three more. Sure. Um, can device tokens be made usable or at least non-annoying for users with enhanced privacy settings like private browsing? Um, yeah, private browsing would mean that the device token is gone. And that's if you use private browsing, you are, again, susceptible to being locked out. But this is something that you need to take into account. There's just no way of recognizing a device. You could go ahead and do something like browser fingerprinting, but that's hard to do and, and, and not a good thing. So basically, if you use private browsing, you, know, you cannot be recognized. Your device cannot be recognized. But that's something that they need to take into account 
if you use private browsing. Um, any recommendations for a good password manager? Because we talked so much. Um, there are lots of good password managers out there. Um, in our company, we use um, KeePass, for example. It's pretty basic. It has not stuff like synchronization features and, on, and stuff like this. I personally use one password because it has the pa one passwords API built in. So if I use a bad password somewhere, one password tells me that is a bad person should change it. Um, there are other good ones like LastPass, for example, but those are all commercial. If you want a free one, uh, it's KeePass, and there are some op uh, applications that can, that can do synchronization as well. Um, he's an expert in password managers. You'd better ask him. And um, you talked so much about the application you developed together with Michael. So the question, is it open source? Uh, no, it's not, unfortunately. Not, not at this point. We were thinking about this uh, very often. Um, but um, stay tuned, because what we want to do is we want to create a central resource for application security design patterns um, like, this, like these here, right? So good starting points for application developers uh, that give you kind of uh, like design patterns for object-oriented programming, but for security. This is something that could help you if you want to build these things into your application. But this application right now is not open source. No, it isn't. Thank you. Somebody said thank you for the English talk. So thank you, Tom. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs>